All right, I'm excited to be here at reInvent. Um, by show of hands, how many of you are Netflix members? All right, awesome. Um, so, yes, I know. Um, so, how much time do you think we have to hold your attention before you choose something to play on a Netflix app? It's just the time it takes for you to sort of decide what you want to play while you're browsing through our homepage. Any guesses? 90 seconds, two hours, two seconds, four hours. Uh, <laughs> our data shows that the typical Netflix member has about a minute or so before they decide whether they want to watch something or they go off the service. And in that little time, if we are not able to present to you the most appealing, most personalized content, then we have lost what we essentially call a moment of joy. So this is a recent version of our current homepage. Everything you see on this page is highly personalized. Starting with the top image on the top that we call billboard. Stranger Things fans, anyone? Uh, yes, there's one boo there. Um, to the, the relevancy ranking of all the content that we, uh, that we rank for you. The evidence that we present to tell you why we are ranking those rows the order in which various rows present themselves for you, and even the title imagery that we show to represent a particular title. Every one of that, those uh, treatment, is essentially personalized for each member profile. And all of these treatments are running on top of a machine learned algorithm. Our goal in the recommendations endeavor at Netflix is to really help you discover awesome content that you can maximize your joy with and be satisfied with the Netflix service. OK, so my name is Faisal Siddiqui. And along with my colleagues, David Shepard and Eugene Sipwa, today we'll be talking about how we are helping uh, build a system for orchestrating machine learned pipelines for Netflix recommendations. Um, just a couple of points uh, logistics. There's a, there's a mic down there, so we'll take questions at the end. Uh, you can line up once, uh, um, once our talks are done. And we'll be happy to uh, chat about them. Also, um, at 1 p.m., uh, we'll be at the Netflix booth at booth 136 on the expo floor. So feel free to drop by if you have more questions or if you just want to learn about what uh, we do outside of this particular talk. So let me set up a little bit of an agenda for how we're going to be presenting this uh, session today. So for the initial part, I will set up a recommendation context for you. So this will tell you uh, what do I mean by a recommender system, really basic stuff. You probably know about it, but just to get a, a good uh, primer on that. Um, then we'll go into providing overview of Mason, which is the solution that we've uh, essentially built in-house uh, for, for solving some of these challenges. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some examples of ML training pipelines uh, and how Mason is helping them. Um, and then we'll move into sort of our second phase of the talk where Davis and Eugene uh, will share our experiences and our learnings while building Mason. And our hope is that some of these things uh, would be useful uh, developer tips for you guys to take to your own projects. All right. Um, the quality of any machine learn system is really dependent upon how good and how rich data set you can provide it. Uh, we're fortunate enough that we, we, we own the stack end to end, and so we have very good, uh, rich streaming data set coming from all the in user interactions that you guys are having. So plays and impressions and user activities, like things that you're adding to your my list or things that you are um, exploring details about, um, all of that is, is sort of the starting point of, of the recommendation systems. Now, we feed that into a training pipeline, uh, and I'll delve a little bit deeper into that in a later part of the talk. Uh, and once the training pipeline has generated a series of models, we use those models to essentially create recommendations for each profile. And we use a variety of different models depending upon the use case. Um, now, once we have this set up, this needs to be able to serve at the scale of Netflix, which means we have more than you know, 108 million users out there, and we really want to make sure that we have, you have a seamless experience when you, when you go to the website and when you hit play. So 
we have built a fairly advanced infrastructure on doing a bunch of this work that can be offloaded and be batch computed into a pre-compute system. And then we store the results into online caches, and those caches are essentially serving uh, and building up that home page. Now, as you would probably imagine, not everything can be pre-computed. There's temporally sensitive contexts like the trending now row and others uh, that do need to be live computed. Uh, but this is sort of a general uh, uh, fallback option for all other cases. We're not quite done yet. Um, this is sort of one way of, of feeding one particular treatment that I talked about. But everything that we do at Netflix, uh, broadly speaking, but even within our recommendation context, uh, we're constantly experimenting with. Um, I like to say that there is no such thing as the Netflix product or the Netflix app. There really is a, uh, uh, an amalgamation of various user experiences that uh, come together, and because of the personalization, that together essentially builds the experience that you see. And so what we have to do, we have to build various different training pipelines and various different models um, and run through various A-B testing um, uh, setups. And so each of the Netflix members are allocated into different A-B tests, uh, and we're constantly evaluating every new feature, every new algorithm that we're loading out uh, to make sure that it sort of, uh, doesn't hurt the usability and the value that you get out of the service, while at the same time improving key performance metrics. Um, and so this really is the context in which um, our world works. And so the rest of the talk is essentially going to be focusing on the trading pipelines. OK, so here's sort of a high-level conceptual view of what happens in your traditional uh, training pipeline. We start out, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with preparing data. So you essentially take a lot of signals that you have, and you stratify them appropriately. So you want to make sure that uh, you're not underrepresenting one particular group or, or clusters. Um, and then you generate various features. And features really are um, sort of a mathematical representation of how you are taking in various useful input signals um, and creating um, a, 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 an abstract concept that can then be used to train and sort of learn your, uh, when the model is learning. And one of the important things here to note is that the feature encoders that we write here in an offline training concept essentially uh, has to be the same code that we use in an online scoring context. And this, the reason for this is um, that data quality is super paramount. We, some of these models are super sensitive to movements of the, these metrics, and we want to make sure that un, uh, unintended consequences and slight changes in data quality don't negatively impact uh, and help us make wrong decisions or, or cause us to make wrong decisions. So then we go into the model training. We use a lot of proprietary algorithms. We also use open source frameworks like Spark and TensorFlow. Uh, and once uh, the training is done, we compute various uh, metrics. We run through the validation sets, uh, alert wherever we need to. Um, and then we go through this hyperparameter optimization and selection phase. We are basically trying to make sure that we're uh, properly regularized. We're going to make sure that we are, we're not doing something that uh, is uh, is hurting anyone, uh, secondary or primary metrics significantly. And ultimately, once we have a, a, a highly tuned model, that model gets published and is sent over to a, uh, essentially a scoring layer. And that's where we do the uh, pre-compute or live compute, um, as I talked about earlier. OK, so there are several challenges uh, with these pipelines. One of the things that a system that is trying to solve this problem needs to do well is to be aware of the inherent heterogeneity of the problem. Every other day you hear about the next new great uh, ML toolkit out there or sort of the, a new data platform out there and you need to be able to put all of these things together and you can't sort of have a one size fit all model. Uh, for failure handling, you wanna make sure that uh, the users of your platform essentially are finding it easy in one place to find all the logs for, uh, for ease of debugging, for instance. Data provenance, data lineage um, are super important for reproducibility. So a problem happened once uh, over a weekend, but when your, your data scientist actually comes on Monday, they want to be able to reproduce that, and they want to be able to track back how and why that happened. Um, and in a growing, uh, increasingly multi-tenant environment, uh, 
you want to make sure that you're doing an efficient uh, resource optimization utilization. Otherwise, you'll end up where, you know, stealing from Peter and for, for Paul. And so you really don't want to make sure that you're over-optimizing on any, any one part of the system. Um, and a system that needs to input a lot of data sources, needs to handle external data triggers as well. Um, so for instance, uh, the system should be resilient to out of order data or uh, delayed data. And so to address some of these challenges, uh, about two and a half years ago, we were dealing with many of these and we, we essentially built Mason. Um, and while Mason was um, introduced in the context of the recommendation systems, it's a fairly generic um, an extensible workflow engine. Um, it can operate at sort of the core workflow orchestration layer where it's just managing tasks and stages. But one of the unique things about Mason is that it can also be closely knit with the execution layer. So for instance, we can attach it to an Apache Mesos cluster and run your Spark apps and each of your stages or steps in a workflow could be an independent Spark job. Uh, we also support uh, running various Dockers at scale. We integrate with uh, the Netflix Docker internal management system. Uh, it's called Titus. Um, and it allows us sort of the freedom to explore things that may not uh, work well in Spark's data paradigm. We've had, a, a, from the get-go, we've had a good support for Scala. Um, and so our primary mode of in integration and interaction with Mason when you're defining a workflow uh, goes through a Scala DSL. But uh, as a testament to Mason's extensibility, we have recently introduced a Python DSL also um, as the adoption of Mason is growing within Netflix. Um, there are a bunch of other features here. I'm not gonna go into the detail. I'll call out just a couple here. Uh, one is, and it'll highlight how Mason would sort of uh, differentiate itself. Uh, one of them is uh, support for loops. So typically your workflow managers would support a directed acyclic graph, uh, but uh, in the context where we were operating, we found uses where it would be handy to be able to sort of loop in a subset of your graph while a certain value of a parameter hasn't reached a threshold, and once it reaches that threshold, you can get out of that loop. And so uh, Mason natively supports that. Um, the other thing that uh, stands out is uh, we support uh, MVEL expressions, uh, which allows our users to be uh, much more expressive in the way they can parameterize their graphs. Okay, some stats on Mason. Uh, We've been using it for a couple of years in production. Um, we have you know, more than 10 different independent deployments within various, uh, uh, various teams that are using uh, Mason. We sort of run a couple of big managed clusters that our team supports, but there's also uh, self-deployed clusters that you know, two-person or three-person teams are just managing on their own. Um, for all the production jobs and the A-B test ML pipelines that are referred to, there's more than 1,000 of them running uh, on a daily basis for retraining those models. Uh, our largest Spark Mesos compute pool has over 2,000 EC2 instances, uh, and we run several tens of thousands of uh, daily step runs. So I'll talk a little bit about what some of these terms mean. Um, so, uh, the web interface is shown here. Uh, essentially, you can see a list of uh, various workflows and some history of success, and then um, it's fairly rich when you click on the various icons. Uh, but if you look at the graph at the bottom, um, this is a, an example of sort of the graph view of one particular uh, workflow. Um, each of those boxes that appear here are essentially uh, a step. So Mason is this concept of a step and a workflow. A workflow comprises of several different steps. Uh, the color coding uh, gives you a sense of what step has successfully completed. Um, so green means you've completed, blue means you're, you're waiting for it, and red and others have uh, um, self-explanatory uh, reasons. So you'll see uh, some more examples of uh, these kind of, uh, these graphs as I talk through the various ML pipelines in the recommendation context. Okay, um, so let's start with an anatomy of, a, of an ML pipeline. So this is an example, this, this is an example of a page construction model. Uh, I started out the presentation uh, showing you the home page, um, and this particular example is an A-B test that we're trying to run to figure out a more efficient way of, uh, of showing content within the whole page. Um, so a couple of things that I want to highlight here. Um, 
are, uh, this is an example uh, of one of those steps, which is executing an ML expression. Um, and so let's say you wanna, uh, you wanna process your data for a feed that was generated 14 days ago, um, and you could uh, literally just write, uh, you know, take a particular date, and then you put in uh, a simple uh, ML expression, and then that gets executed when you push that code over to uh, Mason. Uh, the other point that is highlighted here is about how Mason puts together heterogeneous systems. So the first step there uh, in the middle um, is doing some data preparation, and that's a Spark job. Uh, but once you're done with the data preparation, the training step is essentially using TensorFlow and running in a Docker. Um, and so you're trying to put them together and sort of you can uh, seamlessly bind them. And then right after that, once the training is done and you're trying to compute the metrics for the various A-B test cells, you're back into Spark. And so uh, essentially, we allow the user to use the right tool for the job, and we don't want to shoehorn our, our, our customers, which are data scientists and researchers, uh, to have to stick to one particular technology. Another example here uh, is the box art personalization pipeline. Box art refers to the title imagery, uh, the, uh, which, as I said, is personalized. Um, and this um, shows you, essentially, this maps very nicely to the earlier um, uh, sort of uh, stages of a pipeline for, for training that I talked about. Um, so you do your data preparation, your feature engineering, and you're training multiple models. Uh, eventually, you're trying to make your scoring decisions and your metric distributions, and then you eventually publish. Um, another example here um, is a video ranking pipeline. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward uh, example, but the thing that I want to highlight um, is the way Mason um, allows you to construct your code. Um, even though this is a, is a nice graph and you can actually go and compose these boxes and connect these um, um, through edges, but uh, the most popular usage uh, for defining workflows is through DSL. And in this particular case, uh, the team that manages the video rankers, uh, they've essentially built out a base DSL class. Um, and so the production pipeline is running, and it's all checked in in your code, managed through your SCM system. Um, and anytime you need to run a new A-B test, all you're doing is you're extending the base class. Um, and so, and, that's, and it's sitting right there, and you can compare them, and a lot of times, uh, before we had sort of this nice integration with the DSL, people used to complain about we're not sure which uh, specific code is running in which A-B test, and this is sort of helping with that problem. This is another ranking pipeline. Uh, the example uh, here is showing a, a common pattern, the scatter-gather pattern, uh, which is useful for data parallel training. So data parallel means that instead of trying to send all your data to one particular trainer, you're essentially taking chunks of data and sending those chunks of data to different instances of the same model, and then you're training it on that and putting them together. Um, and so Mason um, enables that um, using the sort of uh, scatter and gather. Um, continue watching pipeline. Most of you are probably familiar with the continue watching row. It's one of our most uh, commonly used uh, rows um, because a lot of you hopefully are binge watchers. You just go there and you click continue watching what you're watching. Um, and that pipeline is also personalized. Um, so there are several things you have to figure out. What is the order in which we would present those titles for you? Um, and when do we, f we think the title is essentially done watching? Are you at the credits? Um, are you at the last season? Uh, last episode, or are you in the middle? Um, but the reason why I show this pipeline here is to give you an example of uh, how Mason helps with uh, deploying sort of uh, 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 deploying a migration strategy when your pipeline is in production. So the the top part uh, is an, an a new way of sort of solving uh, the the continue watching training challenge. Uh, but instead of having to have two separate pipelines, we were essentially able to, uh, to merge that into one single pipeline and reuse all the steps in the front part of that workflow so that we don't have to unnecessarily recompute the data and the features that are going to be same. And so this is an example of how you can put them together. Um, and one more pipeline here as an example. This is a member value modeling pipeline, so we're trying to predict what is the lifetime value of a Netflix member. Uh, it's a very straightforward pipeline, but the key part that I highlight here is that little box, uh, the little circle which has 35 on it. Um, that is a UI way of essentially uh, 
showing the Mason for each feature. And so what for each does, it essentially executes the same step over and over again with different values of a parameter. And in this particular case, we're literally running 35 dockers in parallel with different values of, this, uh, of a particular parameter. And once we, we figure out the parameters that we're, we're, that we're interested in, uh, we essentially put them together and do downstream ETL. So this sort of gives you some sense of how Mason is used, what Mason is for. Um, and at this point, uh, we're gonna move over to sort of the next section of our talk where uh, Davis is gonna talk about some of the lessons learned as we build Mason. There you go. Howdy, I'm Davis, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the lessons we learned um, when architecting the system. You know, Fessel had sort of alluded to some of the challenges we wanted to solve, um, and I kinda wanna sort of drill down on those a little bit. So, uh, first lesson. Uh, data is at the core of every job. Um, now, this may be small and incidental, right? Maybe reading from an external service or as simple as pulling in data from a command line. Um, but most of this data is substantial um, and serves as sort of the, the interface, if you will, um, with these steps with each other, right? And sort of dictates why it is they need to sort of run one after the other. And so uh, in an orchestration system, we need to have a structured way to describe the relationships between uh, these jobs or steps uh, and the data uh, on which they operate. And we do this through a mechanism, what we call sort of data artifacts. Um, <clears throat> and this enables us to describe the relationships um, for sort of two key use cases. So cross-workflow dependencies, um, you know, sort of the edges of these, these flows are gonna produce data that may be consumed elsewhere. Um, and also to synchronize on the availability of data. Uh, and if you don't have this sort of structured mechanism for, for describing these relationships, you're left with um, you know, either brittle sort of job-based dependencies, um, which can often grow stale uh, as the system evolves, or hidden dependencies in the forms of like, you know, delayed timers and clocks to sort of synchronize when data is available. So you need to have a structured way to describe this, this sort of data relationship. And, and this is sort of an example of the usage in the DSL. Um, we can sort of describe, um, you know, the input for the step, meaning like don't actually kick off the relevant work until this data is actually available in the system. Um, and when it's complete, you can sort of announce that this output data set um, is available for any other steps that may be interested in it. Um, immutability, uh, particularly versioned immutability, uh, provides sanity. Um, and we do this by treating the sort of the, the workflow definition as a sort of um, persistent data structure. Meaning so any execution has a durable reference to the definition uh, when it actually ran. Um, and this enables a couple things. Um, because you have this durable reference, uh, you know, multiple people can collaborate on a workflow without necessarily stepping on each other's toes. You know, they can get you know, results and not be impacted by a colleague uh, making a change upstream. And then by maintaining this history um, of all of sort of the versions of workflow that have run, um, we can ensure that if something goes wrong, we can roll back to a good version, you know, very trivially. trivially. Um, and then finally, by maintaining this sort of consistent relationship between each execution and the version uh, that sort of spawned it, we have, we maintain reproducibility, right? We can go back in time and understand exactly the sort of scenario that led to, for instance, you know, a particularly aberrant behavior um, that we want to diagnose. Um, one abstraction does not fit all. Uh, more specifically, one high level abstraction does not fit all uh, in the orchestration space. Um, there's a lot of orchestration tools out there. Um, and, you know, they all sort of make sort of various assumptions about sort of the domain in which they want to tackle. Um, but they all seem to have, you know, a similar core concept. Um, this is sort of evidenced by the many names that they use, right? Maison, we call it a workflow. Other tools will call it a process flow or a pipeline or a DAG or a data flow or an upflow or a downflow. Um, but at the end of the day, this is just a computation graph. Um, and in the process of, of, of designing and building Maison, we were often tempted to try to specialize um, you know, to a particular use case to make it a little bit more usable um, for a given set of users. Uh, and inevitably, this would weaken uh, Maison's ability to address some other use case that we knew we wanted to address. So we're left in a situation now where we have this you know, you know, execution graph, this very flexible system, but it's fairly opaque. How do we bridge that gap now to our users so they actually you know, have a usable system that they can sort of uh, adapt and, and apply to their particular problem space? Um, uh -oh. there you go. Uh, the, and the way we do this is Maison essentially provides uh, workflows as a service. 
Um, so you have this, this abstract sort of, you know, ability to describe a workflow, uh, essentially as a JSON payload, describing all the steps, their relationships with each other, uh, the data um, that is consumed and produced, locations of artifacts that are necessary, um, and this enables uh, essentially any language or framework to produce these workflow descriptions. Um, and so what we're able to do, and as sort of uh, Fessel had alluded to, various teams can essentially tailor and specialize uh, their interface to the orchestration system in a way that they can sort of leverage and get sort of productivity gains in using a more succinct, uh, compact sort of domain-specific language uh, that sort of translates to the common sort of JSON description of these workflows. And so we're able to sort of get the flexibility to be able to tailor the system to all these domains while retaining the core infrastructure and power uh, of a single orchestration system. Um, and we've seen DSLs specifically for doing A-B test orchestration and ML orchestration, um, and now we're, we're seeing uh, DSL specifically tailored for describing ETL pipelines uh, built on top of the new Python DSL, uh, notebook automation, um, and we're still seeing sort of more use cases brought on uh, in this similar pattern. Whoa. Uh-oh, technical difficulties. Oh, the batteries are falling out. That's not gonna be good. Okay, just hold it in and pray. All right, um, I don't know about you, but uh, at least in my time at reInvent, uh, I am certainly overwhelmed by the amount of new technology that's coming out. So, um, you know, it's not just that systems are heterogeneous, they're heterogeneous and constantly changing, right? There's always new hotness, right, that we wanna be able to use and leverage. Um, and so we need to build the system in a way that we can extend and adapt and leverage these new tools. Um, but the problem of orchestration is not going away, right? You need to be able to sort of stitch these together to create cohesive solutions to these sorts of problems. So we need to make sure that this, this, this orchestration system provides lasting value uh, in the face of all this new technology. And when we first built Maison, you know, we'd invested very heavily in Spark. Spark is used throughout the recommendation space and throughout Netflix. Um, and, if, you know, that was, you know, very useful, right? We had to sort of present it, and if it didn't work with sort of the core technology we were using, it's sort of a non-starter. But we know the technology's still moving, um, and we wanted to build it in such a way that it enabled our users to extend the system to the new technology as well, right? We didn't want to be left with the, the burden of trying to constantly extend the system and adapt for new tools and new technologies. And so we can extend it in sort of two ways. Um, we have sort of the custom step interface, which is the means by which Maison, uh, we can teach Maison to talk to new platforms, uh, new core services. So if this is you know, uh, talking to a Mesos cluster or uh, spawning a job out on a new external service, um, you know, Fessel had talked about, you know, Titus internally, um, or to spawn up, you know, spin up an EMR job or something along those lines. And then uh, the DSL itself uh, enables you to reparameterize those existing mechanisms to describe something like uh, TensorFlow on a container, right? We, Mason already knows how to launch a container, so it's merely a matter of reparameterizing that particular step um, with the appropriate parameters in order to describe now a TensorFlow step. So it's, it's one thing to, to sort of be able to now exercise these systems, but it's equally important to be able to feed back sort of structured, distilled, uh, relevant debug information from these systems as well, right? We wanna ensure that, you know, as the new technology comes out, we can maintain a, a native feel for that integration. Uh, and that's motivated by the fact that things break. Uh, and when they do, these systems are complex. So we need to ensure that as much relevant debug information is sort of at hand um, when things are going south. And so we have a mechanism by which um, these steps can feed back small snippets of structured information, what we call artifacts. Um, and we can surface things like, you know, the command line string that was utilized, uh, timeline information about the evolution of that step, you know, links to relevant uh, pages such as, you know, the UI for your Spark job or a history server or a link to that EMR cluster that was spun up. Um, and, you know, having this, this information at hand has really enabled us to sort of keep up and maintain that sort of native level of integration with all these new technologies. Um, and then for the custom step interface, we also wanted to make sure that it wasn't a burden to, to sort of continually extend this. And so there's sort of two core primitives uh, with any sort of orchestration system, right? In our case, we have a Mesos cluster. We wanted to have a baked-in compute layer for convenience for our users. Um, so, you know, we can fork a command um, or we can call out to some service in the world uh, to, to sort of spawn a job elsewhere. And all of our sort of custom step integrations extend from these two core primitives. Um, and that uh, particular approach has enabled us to, uh, you know, extend and, and teach Mason about these new platforms um, fairly trivially. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand off to my colleague Eugene, who's going to talk about some of the lessons we learned in actually building the scheduler itself. 
Thank you, Davis. Hold it tight. Oh, it turned off. Next. Well, all right. Pinch that. Keep the batteries in. Otherwise, I will use the laptop. Okay. Um, hi. Um, so let's dive deeper a bit inside Meson and see what Meson is made of. Um, well, at the core of uh, Meson is entirely written in Scala, and at the core of Meson we had um, this REST API, which is um, offer often something that is underestimated. But actually, a REST API enables um, your system to be used by any kind of other um, systems. It's a point of integration that um, did serve us very well. For example, the fact that you can programmatically create a workflow, enable our users to uh, dynamically, from a, like a running web application, generate workflows, and then trigger them. Um, and on top of this REST API, we did also build um, our rich uh, UI with AngularJS. This UI is mostly used for monitoring purpose, but we also provide the ability to uh, modify and create workflows. Also, we think um, doing this through a UI is not really well, um, is not very good for um, production. For production, we think it's better to define your workflows via code and make them part of your uh, project and uh, your source control. Um, however, for people to try out and to play, uh, it's important. It's important because it will, uh, if I'm new, I come and I want to try Meson, well, probably the first thing I will do, I will just try to go to the UI and play with it. Um, and as a persistence layer, we currently use um, Amazon Aurora. It hasn't been always the case, and we'll talk about this uh, a bit later on. Um, <clears throat> and in the database, we currently store um, the metadata about the different workflows, the, um, their definition, uh, the information about the past executions, the data artifacts that have been announced in the system, um, and basically many different things. And this persistence layer um, can, is being uh, accessed only by our core uh, Meson instance, which is um, an important aspect because that enables us to control how people interact with our database. And we want uh, people to interact with the database through, through our REST API. And it enables us also to, um, to switch, for example, if for some reason we wanted to replace it, well, we could, it would be much simpler. Um, but we don't plan to do it. <laughs> Um, and at the core of Meson, we have our orchestration layer, which is basically um, the system that manages all the logic um, on how you will transition from one step to another one, what to do in case of uh, failure, how to trigger a workflow, um, what to do when a piece of data is announced, find what are the matching workflows that wait for this data to, uh, to come in the system. So this is the single component that manages all this logic. And this logic is not distributed in any way, which uh, simplifies a lot uh, managing this, uh, this complexity. Um, and we parallelize work inside Meson internally via ACA actors. Um, we don't use ACA actors to run the actual jobs. It's really just for internal usage. Um, and um, recently, we also added um, high availability support in Meson uh, via Zookeeper. So basically, we'll have always uh, one leader instance uh, of Meson. Uh, represented by this large box here, um, and a few standby instances. And the via Zookeeper will fail over to one uh, of the other instances. So let's take a closer look to see how we actually run the work in the system, and especially how do we run work in a distributed way, um, which would enable us basically to scale easily by just adding more instances in order to run more work. For that process, we rely on Mesos, which is our execution layer. And the um, core um, scheduling part of Meson is implemented as a Mesos framework, which enables us to receive basically resource offers from uh, Mesos, where a resource offer is um, a structure basically describing how much free CPU, how much free RAM do you have on a given a Mesos agent. Um, and Meson will take those resource offers and match them against uh, tasks that need to be uh, run. Those tasks are basically the different steps that Davis and Fessel were referring to before. Um, and the step is defined also by a, a given set of resources that it needs to run. The matching part, um, we do it actually using Fenzo, which is a Netflix open source library that is designed to help you, to help um, uh, Mesos framework uh, implementers to, uh, to do the scheduling part. So this is really the, the piece that will help you basically to optimize and to decide how to match those resources with the tasks that you want to run. Um, I invite you to check it out. Uh, it makes this part of the work much simpler and it's pretty, uh, pretty nice. It supports different kind of plugins and uh, it's pretty extensible. Um, so once we have this match, we will ask uh, Mesos to run the task. Uh, 
to run the task, um, Mesos will start a Meson executor, which is basically a, a custom code, um, a custom Meson code that implements the Mesos executor API, which enables us to uh, interact with uh, actually uh, our Meson scheduler. Um, so this Meson executor will basically run the, the different steps and through the um, custom step abstraction that Davis was referring to before, we'll know how to run this. We'll know how to start uh, a Docker container in the Netflix cloud, which is Titus, or how to run uh, a local Spark job that will re reuse the same uh, compute resources uh, as a Meson, which will be basically the, meso the local Mesos cluster. Um, <clears throat> this uh, Meson executor will also know how to extract uh, information about, like debugging information about the running job uh, through this custom step. This debugging information could be, for example, um, where can I find the logs? Um, what's the configuration that is being used? Um, maybe a link to the Spark driver UI. So Meson, uh, the Meson executor would then expose this information back to the Meson scheduler. That way we can surface it uh, in our user inter interface. Um, and this communication is being done actually through the Meso Status Updates API, which is an API that provides, a, can be seen as a um, messaging layer in some way that provides you strong delivery guarantees. Um, this enabled us in the early stage of uh, Meson, where we didn't have high availability support, to, um, to decouple the Meson executor from the Meson scheduler. Imagine a scenario where you are deploying a new version of your scheduler. You don't want to kill all your jobs. Uh, that would be dramatic. So you want your jobs to continue to be running, same for your Meson executor. And by using the Status Updates API, um, this, is, uh, this enables us to do this, because basically the, um, the messages will be maintained by a uh, Mesos master uh, until the, uh, the framework will be able to acknowledge them. So for example, in, in the case where we deploy a new version of Meson, once the new version is up, we'll start reconciliation with the Mesos and we'll process, we'll receive again the different status updates that we'll process and then continue on. Um, this did serve us well so far uh, using Mesos because we provide out of the box a compute layer for our users, which makes it much nicer uh, for them to, uh, to, to, uh, to, adapt, to adopt basically Meson because they don't have to provide a separate cluster to run their work actually. Um, so, um, a bit before, I was referring to Amazon Aurora and that it wasn't always the case that we're using Amazon Aurora. So let's, uh, well, let's see this story. Um, initially, we were using Cassandra, actually. So um, Cassandra is widely used internally at Netflix, and um, w w there is a dedicated team maintaining the Cassandra clusters. They uh, optimize the, those clusters and uh, re relieve us from any operational work. Uh, and they provide some nice tooling. Our initial use of Cassandra was pretty straightforward. Uh, it was basically point queries, get a workflow by ID, modify something, write it back. So it was very simple, and for that purpose, it worked pretty nicely. Um, and all the values were stored as part of bytes, basically, in the database. And when we started having like the first times where we wanted to query the data on some attributes that were part of the protobuf message, we started creating uh, some custom secondary indexes. Uh, which are different from the Cassandra QL secondary indexes. Those are not the same ones. So there, there was just some um, homemade uh, indexes. Um, however, our needs uh, started growing, and we want to um, implement some new features that would have um, benefited a lot from a relational database, actually. And we're ending up finding ourselves where we, we wanted to do something, but at that point, uh, it, it would require um, re re reshaping entirely our database. Uh, we want to do aggregations, we want to have more flexibility in our queries, joins, uh, and maintaining those indexes and maintaining that logic on the application side was also too complex. We didn't want to do this. Um, the other issue was that um, it was hard to um, introspect what was in the database as we were storing it as a plain bytes. And um, we're, so often we needed uh, to use some application code to deserialize those in order to, uh, to see what's actually uh, stored in the database. Um, all, the, all those things combined with the fact that actually the data set size that we deal with here isn't that big, it would fit uh, very well on a single instance. We're thinking, well, maybe it's time to just uh, bite the bullet and migrate over to our relational database. 
so that was a pretty big uh, migration because uh, it was after one year and a half of existence of Maison. So you can imagine that uh, we had like already a lot of data, many different teams using it, many different concurrent Maison cluster running. So that wasn't trivial. Um, so that's when we started looking into uh, Amazon RDS, mostly because we wanted a service that would provide us the same um, uh, convenience as what we had with our, our uh, Cassandra cluster. Um, so RDS, uh, for those who are unfamiliar with it, is basically um, Amazon's offering of a relational database in the cloud and comes out of the box with a lot of tooling that we, you will want to have um, when you are running a, production in, um, a database in production at scale. Um, and it supports multiple different uh, database engines, um, like the most common ones like Oracle, MySQL, or Postgre, and Amazon Aurora which is the actual uh, database implementation that uh, we use. Um, Amazon Aurora, um, uh, well, outside of being highly performant, it's also entirely compatible with MySQL. So locally for development, for example, we we'll use MySQL, but actually in production we have uh, an Aurora cluster. And um, another nice thing is um, Aurora can serve actually a, a high uh, number of concurrent requests. Um, and that's something that was important for us because we have many different deployments of Maison that we don't really control. And um, the, the, the number of actual concurrent requests could increase. And usually when you interact with a database, uh, you have a, a connection pool that, uh, for which you will control the size and you can tune based on that. But in this case, uh, we didn't have that granularity of control. Uh, and we're in a multi-tenant environment. So this was a nice feature to have. Um, so let's take a look at our current setup. Um, so currently we have one single RDS cluster per region. Um, and this RDS cluster is basically made of a writer instance that uh, takes all the writes and reads currently. And we have uh, one or more reader replicas inside the same region, um, but in different availability zones. And um, in case of failover, uh, um, so in case of the main writer failing, we fail over to one of the reader replicas. Um, we don't share any data between regions for the Maison, for the rest of Netflix, of course, uh, but not for, uh, for Maison. And so each uh, Maison deployment that is in a different region is completely isolated. And as I was saying before, we have many deployments of Maison. Some are parts of large shared clusters that are being used by many teams in production. Uh, and those clusters are well maintained, and the others are actually just uh, other clusters that the team did the startup for experimentation purpose or uh, just an individual did start it up to play around. And this cluster comes actually with a Mesos set, uh, uh, it's a Mesos cluster coming with Meson in it. And, you, and for each of those deployments, we actually have one logical database in this RDS cluster. So basically the RDS cluster is split uh, and in, inside we have basically one uh, database per Meson app. Um, and those, uh, databases are being created basically automatically because we don't, again, we don't really have control on uh, when someone will start a new cluster uh, with Meson. Um, so, and the other thing to note is the fact that we have many uh, concurrent ver um, deployments of Meson means that they all can run different versions. We have no control over the version that we run. So we need a way to be able to migrate easily from any version to the next one. Um, and for that, we, we had to support uh, automatic database migrations that we currently uh, do via Flyway, which is an open source library. And we define our um, schema migration through SQL scripts and the uh, data migrations, which are the tricky part uh, via Scala code. And uh, those migrations are being applied at startup when a new uh, instance is being deployed or when a cluster is upgraded. Um, one tricky part that um, in, in the scenario where we'll do a red black deployment. So during a red black deployment, basically we want to release the new version, but we don't want to shut down the entire cluster and bring it back up. We want to first, so start deploying the new version, but during the bootstrap of the new version, the old one is still running and the old one is the active, is the active uh, leader uh, for this cluster. And the trick part, you don't want basically to start applying your migrations while the other one is active, because otherwise you would break all your production workload. Um, so uh, for this purpose, uh, we were integrating also with the leadership election uh, of Zookeeper in Zookeeper in order to, to apply the changes only once we become the new leader and um, then continue to, uh, to proceed. Um, one thing to keep in mind also with those um, automatic migrations, 
is that, that it's not very easy actually to roll back. Um, you could roll back up to some extent depending on what type of failure you have, but realistically, I, there are many scenarios where it won't be possible. So our solution to that problem um, is basically to have a testing cluster that always runs the uh, Meson, and we automatically deploy every version of Meson, and that way we can experience actually the different migration issues beforehand. Um, so what did we learn from migrating basically from uh, Cassandra to, uh, from a key value store to, uh, to um, a relational database? Well, first of all, um, hopefully, <laughs> we we're able to, to get more flexibility um, um, while querying the database and interacting with it. Um, this enabled us to implement some new features that otherwise would have been tricky. And um, it wasn't without sorry, more operational work on our side, which was great also. Um, but we learned also that um, despite the database basically will influence strongly the way you design your software. Even if you try to provide layers of abstraction in between, inevitably it will uh, leak in some way. And that might make it harder when you migrate to actually leverage the, um, the features of the new database. So in our case, like for the new, um, new features that we're building on top of our disk, it was easy. We could, it was new, fresh code. But the, for the core parts, the core logic to migrate it, uh, it re required actually even more like um, deep changes in the way we, um, we structure everything. Um, so this is something to keep in mind, and you probably should be very careful um, when you pick your database initially, so you don't have to do this kind of migration. Um, another thing we found that now our interactions with the database uh, are pretty rich, so we write a lot of code uh, doing fancy stuff with it, um, but it becomes harder to maintain because there starts uh, getting a lot of code that is sometimes a bit boilerplate. So we, we are thinking maybe to use a, an ORM that might simplify our life here. The, um, and the last point here is um, about the lazy migrations. Lazy migrations are great, um, but it's tricky. Uh, so if you don't need them, don't do them. <laughs> but sometimes you have no choice. And one thing to keep really in mind when you do this is that you need to maintain old code um, because you want to be able to migrate from any version to the next one. So this means you want to ma uh, maintain your SQL scripts but when you have data migrations, that's very likely to happen. And when it is written in you know, like Scala, Java, or Python, or whatever uh, language you use, so in the same language as the rest of your code, you will need to maintain that. And sometimes this migration uh, logic is tied to some business logic that you are very likely to change in the future. And so it's very easy to break actually past migrations. So I would suggest you to write a lot of tests for this part. Um, so now let's get a bit less technical and um, see another thing that we actually learned. Uh, although it might seem a bit uh, trivial, um, knowing the user, knowing who uses your software, how he is using it. It's actually um, something very important. It's important to be obsessed with your users and talk to them in order to discover how they use your software. Um, and sometimes uh, it can be tricky because you might expect that the user will come to you and tell you, hey, I don't like this, this is not working, or I would imagine that it would be nice to have this feature. But it's not always the case. Sometimes people will accept uh, some inefficiency and uh, some manual work. So it's up to you also to sit with them and see how they use your software, and from there on, try to, um, to see how, how you as an engineer, you could automate all that process and make their life easier. So now let's look how we actually learned this. Um, so through the time, we're trying to work on different features in Meson. We're trying to improve the Scala DSL to make it much more expressive. Um, we're reaching the UI, doing fancy, nice things. And we're trying to um, add advanced features uh, that we thought would be very useful. But during all that time, actually, our users had other problems. The main problem being the way how you go from local code, local workflow definition, and local like your Spark job or Docker container, or how you go to production, from local to production. Um, and this, Im uh, it's simplified here, but this implies a lot of things actually. How do you do this? Most, for, for example, most um, open source uh, workflow orchestration engines uh, leave it up to you to provide the, the runtime environment. It's up to you basically to ship your binaries containing your job code to production. Um, so those were problems our users were facing. How to deploy the workflow definition to a Meson cluster, how to make sure the binaries, uh, like their jar, for example, would be present in the Meson cluster at runtime. 
Um, and we discovered this basically by talking with them a lot and trying to, uh, to understand how they were using our software and not trying necessarily to expect from them to tell us, oh, I don't like this, I don't, or oh, I like that. Um, and our current solution is um, a solution very um, focused on our main user base, which is on a base that is coding mostly on the GVM. Um, so uh, for them, and they use um, Gradle as their build system. So in this case, we provide a Gradle plugin that will basically integrate with uh, their project and will package everything and uh, deploy the, uh, the workflow and make sure the banners are available at runtime. Automating this part. Um, enable us actually to have a hook also in the, in the uh, deployment process. So we can actually automatically enrich the workflow for the user with some metadata. We, for example, uh, add also information about from what branch does this code co uh, come, um, what's the repository that it comes from, uh, what's the git commit uh, ash, and other things. So that has been very helpful. Um, and it also, and it, um, automating this process enabled us to automate also the workflow releases. So now um, every workflow deployment to production, I mean a, a release of a workflow, is automatic and goes through Jenkins. Basically when a pull request is being merged, um, a Jenkins pipeline will be triggered and it will run canary workflows. A canary workflow is, is basically the same as the production workflow that you want to deploy, except that it, it works on a subset of the uh, input data, so it doesn't run forever, and writes to another destination than the production one. And once this canary workflow uh, finishes uh, successfully, we proceed on with deploying the production ones, actually. Focusing on how the user interacts with our system helped us also discover um, places where we didn't um, provide something that was needed. And if we were to, um, in this case, it was uh, the user didn't have a way to um, push back information from within the running code. So like from, from his Spark job, for example, the user couldn't push back information to Meson that could be used then in the downstream jobs. Um, and we found that basically by providing this, actually they would be able to leverage and get much more power from some other advanced features that we have in the system. And some of those systems, uh, some of those features are for example the loops of for each. You can imagine a first step that would basically query some database, does, do some processing, and get a list of countries. Then emits this list of countries back to Meson, and then we use a for each step that will iterate th through this list of countries and run a, a job that will maybe train a model for each of those different countries. The other example where um, we think it can be very helpful um, and a, a strong feature for our us users is the debugging information that uh, you've seen before and uh, Davis also uh, referred to it a bit, um, that would describe basically um, a link to, 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 um, to a, uh, that would be an URL to a job, or could be an image uh, that represents um, a graph, uh, represent the validation metrics of your model maybe. Um, so this kind of, of information now can be emitted back from the user code. And then they can customize and surface the information they want directly in the uh, Meson UI. Um, so this is something that we are currently working uh, actively on. And um, also, as Meson has been very widely adopted internally uh, this year, and will continue to be uh, so, um, we also want to make sure that actually Meson scales. Uh, scaling not only from a performance point of view, but also scaling in uh, supporting all the different use cases that come in. Um, we also want to improve the integra uh, make a tighter integration with the user code uh, at runtime via this Meson context. And uh, we also want to, um, to support more sophisticated pipelines that integrate better with uh, machine learning uh, usages. Um, so, and there are a few other talks that uh, our peers from Netflix are giving, so I invite you to check them out. I hope that you learned one or two things from this presentation. And if you have any questions, it's the moment. As I mentioned earlier on, uh, I'm not, uh, we also are um, at the Netflix boot, number 136, from 1 to 2 p.m. If you want to learn about Mason or other questions uh, about things that we do, you're more than welcome. And we're going to hang out for here for a few more minutes. Thank you. <laughs>